Welcome to Voices from the Bench, a dental laboratory podcast. Send us an email at info at voicesfromthebench.com or look for us on Facebook at Voices from the Bench. Greetings and welcome to episode 219 of Voices from the Bench. My name is Elvis. And my name is Barbara. What's happening, Barbara? Do you have a good holiday weekend? Oh, yeah. My son was in a baseball tournament down in Fort Myers, and it was like 93 every day, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Uh, but I enjoyed the hell out of it. You know, he's only got a couple more years. He's actually going to be a senior th- this year. So another year. It was fun. How about you? Is he going to play college? Yeah, I believe so. That's why he's in these tournaments. They've got scouts that come out to these tournaments. He's just a really good ball player. Hates school, but loves playing ball. So hopefully we'll we'll get him in college. (laughs) (laughs) Fingers crossed. Yeah. My holiday weekend was full of house chores and projects. Oh. It needed to be done, but here in Indiana, we hit the 90s too. Come on. Finally? Yeah, but you got to remember, Indiana 90s is worse 90s there is it's terrible God. thick yeah it's i thick. bet and then next week it'll snow it will snow it when will i'm snow. down in florida enjoying <laughs> your 93 degree weather this weekend because we're recording early because of the fdla yes we are yeah so we're gonna head out there tomorrow tomorrow yeah so for those that wanted to hear about barb on stage by now you should have heard it in the news so it would have made national news oh shut up <laughs> it's just a panel come on i know but we love hyping it it's gonna be fun and it's gonna be a great show looking forward to it same here so remember all this month we are playing audio thanks that people send in to us to help us celebrate cdt and dental technician appreciation month make sure you stick around to the end of this episode to hear the very disappointing amount that we got this Aww. week yep but they are not any less important. So please send us a simple audio file using your phone or computer and email it to us, and we will play it next week. It's super easy and a fantastic way to show the love within our industry. Make sure you stay until the end. Oh, yeah. So, Barb, next weekend, I'm going to be at the Maine Licensed and Tourist Association meeting in Portland, Maine. Yeah, Elvis, that's great. Hey, Elvis, you're <laughs> going to the Dentures Association, which I know damn well is going to be a great meeting. Are you super psyched? I am super psyched. I've never been to Portland, Maine. And this weekend, June 10th to the 11th, they're having a meeting and I'm going to be up on stage talking. Are you going to do your awkward presentation or are you going to do your Elvis presentation? I'm going to do studs at the bar, <laughs> which is kind of the Elvis. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. All right. Studs at the bar. <laughs> so we love the denturist profession on this podcast. It is a great career path for many technicians. Unfortunately, it's not allowed in many states. But Maine is actually one of the states that it's legal. So this week, we welcome back on the podcast our good friend, Patrick Allen. Patrick is very involved with the profession on a state and national level. We've had him on a few times, and he's always good to update us on what's going on in all things denturism. But this time, he invited on two additional denturists to join us in this great conversation. First up is Austin Carbone. He's been in the field before it was even legal. He has spent years fighting for the right to practice, teaching at George Brown College, and spreading the importance of education. And also joining us is a newly graduated denturist, Ashley Sosi. Ashley brings the dynamic of the next generation of denturists. She talks about the process of going to the American Denturist College, learning from Austin and other mentors, and staying involved on the state and national level and keeping the awareness alive. Which is amazing, just saying. It is amazing. So join us as we chat with Patrick Allen, Austin Carbone, and Ashley Sosi. Hi, this message is for the many dentists and dental staff that are listening to Voices from the Bench every week. The fastest growing product that we have at Growth3x are our Growth3x aligners. Growth3x aligners are only available from Growth3x aligner certified labs. Why? Because we believe in the synergies that are being created between you, the dental office, and your lab. And we want to further leverage these synergies. 
Our aligners are, for instance, used as a pretreatment to larger restorative aesthetic cases. They're used to widen gaps prior to placing implants. They're used to close the diastema, ease crowding, and simply enhance your patient's smiles. Even for your Essex retainer needs, your Growth 3X Aligner Certified Lab can help. Look for a Growth 3X Aligner Certified Lab near you, such as Castle Dental Lab in San Antonio, Texas, ask for Blaine, AMK Dental Lab in O'Neill, Nebraska, ask for Anne, Stax Dental Lab in McCool, Maryland, ask for Derek, AA Dental Design in Marietta, California, ask for Frankie, and many, many more. For a complete listing of Growth 3X Aligner Certified Labs, go to www.growth3x.com. Thank you, Growth3X, and we appreciate your support of the podcast. Voices from the Bench. The Interview. Yes. Yeah, we're going to rock and roll right into it. Barb, it was just a couple weeks ago that I said, I think we need to have some dentures back on this program. Heck yeah. And it wasn't long after that, that good friend, and I'm going to call him my staple denturist, Patrick Allen, put together some people that he thinks would make a great conversation. Patrick Allen, welcome back to the podcast. How are you, sir? I'm doing well. I think this is actually my third go around. Oh my gosh. We might be going for a record here, people. Is that the kind of record we want? I don't know. Maybe a few more and you can start having your own podcast. I'll take it, yeah. <laughs> so Patrick, you're a denturist out of Maine at the, uh, what's the name of your practice? Central Maine Denture. Central Maine Denture. And you're big into the advocacy and the promotion of denturism. National board, the main board, all of that, right? I am. I'm actually starting to take a, a little bit of a, a step back here and trying to uh, to get new people in and get new ideas. So uh, I'm kind of in the backdrop here, uh, like working with young folks like like Ashley and, uh, and trying to get like on our national board, trying to get newer, younger people with, with fresh ideas coming to the table and figuring out how we can make things better. Yeah, we need to have other denturists we can have back on the podcast multiple times rather than just you, Patrick. So it's good. It's good. That you're passing on the baton. We do appreciate all that you've done. Yes. But joining us also on this episode is two denturists, also in the main area at Jetport Denture Center. That's right. Awesome. So, first of all, we have Austin Carbone. See. <laughs> See. Well done, Elvis. We had a little debate. Austin Carbone, Carboni. I went with what he wanted. Yeah. Austin, how are you, sir? I'm well. Thank you very much, sir. Awesome. And then with you is your associate partner. I'm not sure the dynamic. Ashley Susie. How are you? Good. How are you? Doing fantastic. So we want to get into the hows and whys both of you became denturist. And we're going to go with Austin because I'm guessing you've been in this for a while. Let's hear your history. How did you get into the profession? Well, I started off with regard to anything at all to do with dentistry as a dental laboratory technology candidate and a survivor of the U.S. Air Force Dental Laboratory School, which at that time was in Montgomery, Alabama at Gunder Air Force Base. Okay. And from there, I finished up my time in the Air Force. I worked as a dental lab technician. I decided I wanted to do some changes, and I went out and got myself an engineering degree, and I worked for Raytheon Missile Systems for a while on the Patriot Missile. And, you know, oh, wow. At that time, it was called the SAMD. So what's the, I mean, teeth, missiles, I mean, really, what's the difference, right? <laughs> oh, that's right. You know, yeah. I'm sick, I'm so. so anyway... <laughs> From there, I had uh, uh, anxious feet, and uh, my wife is Canadian, and uh, we decided to move to her home, which is Newfoundland in Canada. Wow. Okay. And when I was there, I took a teaching job, and uh, I ended up getting a teaching degree there. 
from the uh, Memorial University of Newfoundland. And then from there, I got in contact with the dentures who were illegal at that time in Newfoundland. And I joined their group and uh, started doing that with them. And I opened a, a clinic and I taught at the same time. Uh, and I'm trying to abbreviate all this, okay? Uh, sure. there's, there's way too much to say. You don't have a week to listen to me. <laughs> From there, okay, I made contact with the executive of that association, and I became part of that executive and ultimately ended up being on the Dentures Association of Canada. I was going to school at George Brown College, which was in dental technology as well. And I later became president of the Dentures Association of Canada for six years. And then from there, I got involved. With, I was president of the International Federation of Dentures. And wow. it was about that time we decided to move back to the U.S. And uh, when we did, I got involved with the National Dentures Association and eventually ended up being president of the National Dentures Association and the International and the D. Oh, you know, and it goes on and on. <laughs> and the band plays on, okay? And anyway, uh, I came to Maine and uh, I met a whole bunch of real good folks, you know. And I met up with Patrick and Bill Buxton and uh, a few other people. And, mm -hmm. and this is where I've been ever since. And I've been working, you know, with them and, and friendly with them and doing what I can to help out in a more backseat situation. I've been out there, you know, like Patrick just said, it's time to kind of sit back and let other folk take over. And, and that's what I did here about, uh, I don't know, six, seven, eight years ago, something like that. So there you are, and here I am. And then the best thing happened to me. I worked for Bill Buxton for a couple of days a week because he needed a bit of help. And lo and behold, who walks through the door but Ashley Susie? Yeah. And <laughs> wow. that was a ray of light. Aww. And she can take it from here. That is a great segue. Just saying, <laughs> well done, Austin. Thank you. Thank you very much, Barbara. Thank you, Barbara. Do you need a job? Yeah. <laughs> So Ashley, what brought you into this? So it kind of goes back to when I was in high school. I lived in a small town. In Maine? In Maine, yep. Aren't all towns in Maine small? Most of them, yes. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> They got big lobsters. Yeah. Can we uh, can we cue in the journey song there? <laughs> <laughs> uh, my grandfather had dentures, and the dentures practice in his office was open only one day a week. And he said. Why don't you go make dentures? There's not enough people out there to do it. You're kidding me. That is so cool. It, wow. Yeah. So in my senior year in high school, I took CAD and I needed to do my senior project. And I decided after that statement that I was going to draw dentures. Now, this was in 2012, 2013. And digital dentures, what I know now, was not big then mm, at all. No, yep. yeah. Just baby steps. And I contacted Bill Buxton at New England Denture Center, and I went down to kind of shadow for the day and ask him, pick his brain for some questions. And ultimately, I actually met Patrick there that day. Oh, wow. Small world. Small world. And so I found out I couldn't draw dentures like I wanted to. And I ended up copying my x-rays, you know, drawing my teeth. And I applied for dental assisting school. I got in. New England Denture Center needed a denturist assistant, so I applied. And I walked in and I met Austin. And then the Wednesday after I started, I met Pat again and just came back circle. And I actually moved down to Portland about three years after that. I went back to being a general dental assistant. And was tired of that. And then my school, I had an opportunity to go back to school to be a denturist. And I met it back up with Austin when I needed to do my externship. And there it is now. Wow. And I never left. <laughs> you can't get rid of me. <laughs> Something you mentioned, Ashley, you are a denturist assistant. How is that different than just a regular clinical assistant? Well, and I should say, I originally went to school to be a dental assistant, so doing fillings and all that stuff. Yep, yep. And when I went to be a denturist assistant, I just, I wouldn't call it cleaning up after everybody, but I, I did treatment plans with patients. <laughs> I learned how to talk to patients about their treatments, um, yeah. treatment planning 
things like that for the patients, you know, types of dentures, things like that versus just fillings and crowns and bridges all day long. Sure. Is there an actual degree in denturist assisting? I, no. Okay. Patrick, how many assistants do you have? Um, kind of one. Uh, my <laughs> wife. Yeah. Again, my practice is kind of a, a throwback to mom and pop yeah. sort of mentality. So it's just my wife and I, between the two of us, we do a little bit of everything. Yeah. And going back to Ashley's story about uh, when we met briefly the first time and it was, mm -hmm. it was sort of like, uh, it was this really like not back moment when uh, my assistant at the time had, uh, had actually moved into kind of like an office manager type role. And, uh, and I was kind of bouncing between a couple of different offices. So I was only in the, the big office one or two days a week and Austin mm -hmm. was filling in a couple of days. And then um, my old assistant had said, hey, we're hiring this young girl who uh, is coming out of dental assisting school. And she said her goal ultimately is she wants to be a denturist. I'm like, oh, that's great. That's fantastic. You know, not realizing it was, it was actually Ashley. Mm -hmm. And then the first day we worked together, uh, you know, sometimes you don't put faces and names and everything together. And it was like the whole day. And then I realized, wait a minute, how does a young girl who's like 19 or 20 years old know what a denturist is? You know, most of the general population doesn't know. And then like it like popped in my head and I'm like, wait a minute, you're that girl. And she's like, yeah, <laughs> that's me. Aww. So, uh, so yeah, it was kind of cool to see someone at, at such a young age. And that's what makes me think that if we can uh, get our profession better known and get it out there, there's lots of people who would love to get involved. You know what joy can be from being a uh, dental technician, working with your hands and creating smiles there. And it's even in my mind, it's even on another level when you get to go and see it come alive in the mouth. And, you know, we have a lot of older patients who would say, man, if I had it to do over again, I'd love to do something like this, but uh, we've got to get younger people uh, involved. So, so that's why I'm, I'm happy people like Ashley are coming along and, and helping to uh, carry the torch. Yeah, for sure. So Austin, when you were telling your story, did I hear you correctly that when you started, it was illegal? That's correct. Yeah. It is still illegal in many States. Yeah. So when you started, how do you start something knowing it's illegal? By keeping a low profile. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, okay. I mean, denturism historically, traditionally starts out illegal. Yeah. In every country that I know of, and I've traveled to just about all of them, okay, around the world, in every province in Canada, every state in the United States, they all started out illegally. And in the States, I think there's what, maybe seven now, Pat, eight that are legalized. So I think we've got six that are actually legislated. And then there's, I think, uh, a couple that are, you know, it's not illegal. And I think there's people that, you know, there's sort of a, maybe a, a general understanding that, you know, uh, yeah. it's, it's, it's not, it's not it, trouble. It's been a fight, uh, Elvis, uh, yeah. you know, and, uh, and it remains so for some places. I mean, we have pretty good darn scope of practice here in Maine. We can do everything from full dentures dentures over implants, partials, uh, all that kind of stuff. But there are places where they're still illegal uh, with regard to uh, simply doing a full denture, you know. I've always been a huge proponent for these people, okay, that they need to get educated and they need to have a good association and uh, they need to present themselves, okay, legislatively because that's where things get changed. There's not a whole lot of sense when you're illegal to go to a dental board or that type of place looking for legislation. Uh, you need to go to your legislators and you need to have uh, something to back yourself up with. And that backup is education. You can't even mop the floors in a hospital these days unless you've got some sort of certificate. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I uh, believe that, and, and uh, that's what I, I try to provide people with with regard to information on how to get started. With all of the associations that you sat on in Canada, were you part of making uh, having it become legal in Canada with all those years of service? Yes. As a matter of fact, when, uh, when I joined the guys and the women in Newfoundland, okay, mm -hmm. uh, they were illegal, and we worked hard. And we got it done and we got legislation and we got legalized, but we did it with education, right? 
Yeah. And we did it with education through George Brown College in Toronto, mm-hmm. through their uh, International Dentures Education Program, which uh, myself and Bill Buxton Sr. were instrumental in, along with Michael Vicalis, who was the head of the program at that time, to put together the uh, IDEC or the International Dentures Education Center. And that education was uh, recognized by the legislature and in Newfoundland. It was also recognized by the dental board and legislation here in Maine. And that's how things got maybe not necessarily created, but got furthered with regard to the profession and legislation and scope of practice in these states and provinces. That's fantastic. How many years did that take you, I might add? The program itself is about three years. Wow. It took a whole lot more than three years, <laughs> as yeah. these people sitting here with me can tell you, to, to actually get get her done, so to speak, as Larry, Gary, whatever the heck his name is, says. Yeah. <laughs> wow. I suppose it's always ongoing. It's a evolutionary sort of work in progress, even though some states and and uh, Canadian provinces, they they have a, a enjoy a full scope of practice. There's still a lot of work to be done. Are any of the laws being met with resistance after they're passed? Are there people trying to fight the states and provinces that's already legal? Very little. On occasion, there is uh, a dentist or two. <laughs> yeah, uh, pe- people that that try to criticize or or poo poo. Uh, what's been legislated and so on and so forth. But I don't think anybody has had any success in removing what we have put in place that I can think of anyway. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, Recently in Washington State, there was uh, there was a little bit of a pushback on their scope of practice is quite progressive, the way that they work with dentists and do, uh, you know, especially uh, implant complex dentures over implants. And, uh, and I, I don't think there was any, any progress or any digression in that fight for the scope of practice, but it's, it's still a little uh, unnerving and a little alarming when your livelihood and your, your uh, scope of practice is being challenged like that. Sure. I can imagine. Why do you think they went after the implant aspect of it, Patrick? You know, I think that, um, oh, where the money is. Yeah. Well, yeah, I, I, I think I put it simply, you know, I think that in a lot of uh, respects, like when it comes to mostly dentures, uh, but also, you know, even partial dentures, any type of removable dentistry is going to come in at a lesser satisfaction level as opposed to crown and bridge work or as opposed to fixed implant work. Mm-hmm. In dentists that we talk with quite often, they're quite happy to, to partner and work with us. Because they know that, gosh, that's the stuff that takes me the longest. Oh, yeah. It's the least profitable. Yep. And gosh, it just at the end of the day, you know, it's it's hard to set those types of expectations when you can do, you know, a really nice bridge or, you know, a set of crowns and, and it's going to act and behave just like real teeth. Uh, I had a dentist tell me once, why do I want to do, you know, five or six appointments into a denture and the patient may still come away not liking it? And not because I didn't do a great job, but because they're just not happy with what they've got as an outcome when I could do uh, a nice bridge and two visits and the patient loves me and pays me my fee and we all go our, our separate ways. You know, so I think there is some truth to that. I'm sure there is some measure of concern over the scope of practice as far as our education and our, our capability. But at the end of the day, you know, I, I, don't, I don't think that's really the, uh, uh, the concern. I don't think that's really 100% why that, uh, that fight was had or those questions were raised. And it didn't go anywhere. (laughs) It's definitely a lot of dentists out there that don't want to touch removables. I mean, (laughs) I saw a lot of them at the lab I was (laughs) at. Not only uh, are they they're just not comfortable with it, they're not getting as much exposure to it. I know a friend of mine who was a longtime hygienist and went back to school to become a dentist. She said she had to kind of like fight and beg and plead and kind of steal a couple of cases to do denture work while she was uh, finishing up her clinical stuff. And she said, man, she's like, I had to do it because I knew, you know, you'd never let me live it down if I didn't make, you know, come out of dental school and ha- having had made a, a denture. But even still, you know, the, get a lot of a lot of phone calls going, gosh, what do I do? How do I how do I handle this? So and I, and I think that that's OK. I think uh, as long as dentistry is understanding that, hey, they're going to kind of focus less on on removables, certainly don't push back on us to, you know, to fill that need and take care of that deficiency in dentistry. You know, uh, people you're talking to, the dentists here today, yeah. we're all big. 
we're all big on education, okay? Oh, sure. And the education is pretty extensive. Of course, I can't remember all of it, but maybe Ashley can tell you what she went through with regard to courses and clinical and uh, didactics and so on and so forth. Ashley, I was actually going to ask you to follow up with Patrick. Did you learn a lot about removables getting your dental assistance degree? I would say very little. Yeah. Book-wise, maybe a chapter on it. Really? Um, and then I didn't see a whole lot in my externship with my dental assisting. Maybe one or two dentures, but not a whole lot. They would either send them somewhere or I just never saw anything. No. Then you go to the American Denturist College, and I'm sure it kind of exploded for you. Yes, yes. So um, I was very lucky. I had a background with um, working at New England Denture Center with Austin and Pat. Um, so I did see stuff before I went to school, but my schooling was really rigorous. I It was three years of my book work in uh, didactics. And then in the third year of my book work, I actually did my lab work at that time. And so juggling both of them and I was working full time. And then after all the book work was done, all the lab work was done, I had a full year's worth of um, internship, which with COVID, I, I was one of those that uh, oh. my externship supposed to be stopping in the summer of COVID of 2020. So I still I couldn't go to Canada to take my test, uh, so I still had another year of my externship, which was wonderful, and then I took my test in the summer of 2021 right here in Maine, and that was rigorous because it was a kind of a not condensed version of the test, but it was condensed into one day, so I had to make a denture, a full, full, full denture in one day. What is externship? Like, what do you do? What is, what is that like? It's an internship, but it's done outside of the school. So in my... So you work somewhere? Yep. So I actually did my externship with Austin uh -huh. um, and I had to do 42 cases of all types of different dentures. So full 42? folds of 42. 42. Wow. Yeah. So um, full, full dentures, immediate dentures, full partials, full dentures over implants, full dentures against natural dentition, uh, repairs, reline rebases. So there's criteria that you have to follow for each of those types of cases. Do you have to document and have so many of each and photos? Yep. So I actually had a nice big binder that had to be signed off on every part I did. Austin had to watch everything I did, all my lab work, all my um, patient interactions. And it was boring. <laughs> <laughs> you were her mentor. I love it. The damn binder was seven inches thick. <laughs> like, I had to take pictures of everything, everything I did. I don't think there could have been more documentation that I could have done because there was a lot. How so, hard was Austin on you? I was going to say. <laughs> Every portion that I did, it was, I had to go right to him, make sure everything was good. If nothing, if something was not right or a little bit, you know, wonky, nope, redo it. We got to redo it. This is not right. It really set me up good to be, like to say the dentist that I am now, very particular on things and very hard on myself if something's not quite correct. Yeah, I'll say so. And I can vouch for that. And I can't think of having a better colleague than Ashley in my office. Nice. Mm -hmm. You molded her to exactly what you needed. Yes. <laughs> She's great. Well, he calls you the ray of light. I mean, what better compliment is that? You know, yeah. <laughs> there is none. Somebody that's you know, been doing thank you, it thank for you. a long time. And then somebody that walks in and that you can you know, partner up and he can give you all of his knowledge and he watches you grow. And oh my God. I appreciate being referred to as a ray of light because I always considered myself like the wind and the stars and the moon. <laughs> and I think I'm so fortunate because I do have Austin as a great mentor and I have Patrick as a great mentor and they come from, I wouldn't call it two different generations of denturism, but they definitely started at different times. So, so I can see how it's grown over the years. It's, it's wonderful. Mm -hmm. So talk about the practice you guys are in now, the jet port. 
is it all analog? Are you doing any digital work or? It's all analog. We, okay. we aren't uh, digital. So are you looking to grow into that or are you hoping to adapt to digital? I would like to look at some of the digital stuff. At this point, we're just straight analog. Mm-hmm. Um, but certainly at some point in time, making a slight transition over would be nice. Elvis, uh, Ashley is 27 years old. At the end of this month, I'm 79 years old. I'm out past digital. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. You don't but, want to learn the computer? Come on. <laughs> Are you kidding? I couldn't even turn this one on. Good thing she's here. <laughs> Patrick, are you guys doing any digital at this time or starting to? Yeah, we're, we're starting to. It was actually about, yeah, it was, it was uh, at the end of 2020 that we, we got a, a lab scanner and an intraoral scanner. And then, but they kind of sat stagnant and dormant for a while. We, we were so busy after uh, the uh, COVID shutdown. Yeah. Yeah. The, once we climbed back into things, I mean, it was it was like a runaway train. It was it was wild. So we just didn't really have the. I didn't feel like I had the time put into it, and uh, and I realized very quickly that it's not just a plug and play and just start you know turning out uh, yeah. turning out work with it. So it was almost a year before I finally got around to getting all my training on the intraoral scanner. Mm-hmm. And yeah, because it was time to renew fees, and I was like, "Gosh, I haven't even turned the thing on yet." So, <laughs> oh, geez, yeah, that's a yeah. hard bill to pay. Yeah, <laughs> it, it is. It was. So uh, I was like, "All right, I need to do this." And then talking with some of the a lot of the Canadian dentists, they're a little more progressive. They've kind of they've, they've sort of been at it a while. Uh, they've been into the digital stuff for some of them five, six, seven years. Uh, I started leaning on a lot of them, like. Uh, Esther Swenning and Eric Kukuchka and sure. uh, Mark Chan and, uh, you know, talking with them, getting some guidance on what to do. And it's funny because even a few years ago, a lot of the dentures were like, get a lab scanner, start there. And so that's kind of what, where I focused a lot of my energy and my time. And then once I finally started doing some intraoral scanning, I found for like partial dentures and for immediate dentures, like there's a huge benefit to, to those things, especially. I, I, I've only done a couple of traditional um, replacement dentures digitally, but yeah, for immediates, it, it's awesome. And the being able to show patients right on the screen, this is, these are your teeth, this is what you have for natural stops and contacts, and this is why you need this, you know, you need teeth here, you need balance. It goes a long way to getting them you know, more interested in say yes. <laughs> yeah. I yeah. Well, they, they become much more invested. They can't look the other way. You know, yeah. they, they see it there. It takes away all the lips and cheeks and tongues. It's not just looking in the mirror and seeing the, the you know, the forward facing, you know, part of things you can see 360 degrees all the way around. So it's pretty hard to, to hide from some of that. So we get a lot of people that do, they buy into the treatment and, the, and it's really because they understand why. Yeah. And, and I find more and more that's that's more important. Like when Austin talked about uh, education being the key, you know, he, he has a famous phrase when technicians will say, yeah, but I know how to make a denture. And he said, well, but do you know why? And that's what the, the education will do is uh, is get you to a point where you understand why we do what we do. Now, I think th- there's a lot of upside to digital, but there, there's still some things that are, I think, uh, you know, there's some struggles and there's some uh, there are still some barriers with it, so uh, but it's it's come leaps and bounds, you know, over the over the past sure. few years. But I do like the fact that you're utilizing them right now for immediates. Yeah, because just like you said, you know, it's it's try on smile. They they're involved in the technology part of it, and the smile and the teeth and the contacts, and I think it's invaluable when you can add the patient into the whole process and they can go through it with you. Well, and I think too, even there's there's some little um, things that you can't do analog or you or I shouldn't say you can't do it but you probably couldn't do it as as pretty or as well like we had a a, a massive class two with this uh, you know there was one side there, there'd be almost no way I could conceivably bring the posterior teeth in on one side to to get you know good contact and connection and you know Eric with the design he was able to actually just kind of stretch the teeth over a bit and uh, it was just plug and play. You know, we put the denture in and it was just beautiful. Uh, nice. and it worked really well. So there's little things where you can stretch and morph and, and hopefully later on, you know, his, um, you know, his situation as he heals, things will change and um, still doing replacement dentures, you know, by hand, but, but from a digital standpoint, it's definitely saving my thumbs and fingernails oh, yeah. from all the grinding. So yeah. really happy. Ashley, did they cover a lot of digital in the American Denturist College? 
they did not, but there is a added one year course that you can take. Um, and in that program, they cover a lot of digital. Oh, so it's like a, an extra year on top of your extra license. Oh, of wow. Yes. You're going to do it? Eventually I am. Yes. They're offering a bachelor's extension. So uh, it's kind of cool that we, we now can get a, uh, a degree in, in indenturism. So. Really? So what was it before? Just a license, right? A diploma. A diploma. And then now you're going to have a bachelor's degree? Yeah. Very wow. cool. Wow. Yeah. Austin, you going back to get it? No, I already got three of those. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> we just said, Elvis. Come on. <laughs> He's done. <laughs> 79 years old, three degrees, lots of things happen in your life. I'll tell you, it's pretty impressive. That's for You sure. almost have more letters after your name than letters in your name, man. <laughs> yeah, pretty close. But it's been a trip, I'll tell you. And there's not a country that has denturism that I can't go to, okay, and walk into a friend's home and sit down and enjoy their company. That's so awesome. That has been phenomenal for me, uh, you know. And well, it's like Patrick now is kind of taking up that particular sort of uh, venue in his life where he's meeting people all over the world and, and doing things like that. And that's a great thing. You know, I never went anywhere in this world, but where I did not learn something from someone. And and that was important to me. Well, you haven't met me yet, so. <laughs> well, that, that's coming up the end in June. Yes, sir. Let's yeah. talk about that real quick. Good segue. You guys are great at this. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> coming up in June is the Spring Dental Educational Forum out in Portland, Maine. The Maine Licensed and Tourist Association meeting, right? Did I get it? Right. Yes. 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 Out in June. That's exciting. I actually get to go. Preet sending me out there. I'm super excited. So all four of you are going to be there? Wow. Yeah. Trouble abound. I'll tell you. <laughs> Ashley was uh, instrumental in uh, helping to put this thing together. All right, Ashley. How'd you get involved with the main association? Um, well, really goes back to when I was an assistant at New England Denture Center. And I just always wanted to do more, learn more, do more, just more. And yeah. so this year, Pat wanted to kind of take a step back. And I took over his position within the MLDA. Um, and he, for the past several years, has put on the conference and he's been instrumental in getting people. And now this year, I am the head of the education committee and the conference committee with the MLDA. So I have put together the conference. Awesome. And, and you've never done this before. No, I, I was a fish out of water, so to speak. <laughs> <laughs> but Pat helped a lot, Yeah, um, you know, making connections with people. And, and I think that's the biggest thing is once I can make a connection with somebody, uh, then I can take it from there. You sure. know, I, you know, it's very easy to chat with somebody uh, just as, as soon as somebody says, hey, this is so-and-so. Perfect. I'm, I'm there. So yeah, you're good to go. Yeah. Yep. So what kind of courses are you guys having this year? Since I won't be there, unfortunately. So Ashley, since you're running the whole show, let's talk about this upcoming Maine Denturist Association meeting. What's it? Portland or Port, I always want to say Oregon <laughs> in Portland, Maine in yep. June. Yes. Talk, let's talk about it. Who do you got coming? So we've got a, a few people coming. First and foremost, we have you coming and you're talking. What? Yeah. <laughs> you are talking about different types of implants, abutments and overdentures. Yeah. Stud attachments and overdenture bars. Super excited. That is very exciting. Then we have James Angelone um, with Strawman. He's coming and talking about implants as well. James Angeloni is an amazing presenter. He's phenomenal. Yep. It's pretty bad that I got to follow him. I'm just saying. <laughs> um, I got to follow that. It's going to be tough. <laughs> I know somebody who might be able to switch some things up if we need to, you know. <laughs> no, I'm get just the better kidding. on you. <laughs> <laughs> and then we have Esther Schwenning coming. Awesome. She's amazing. 
She is phenomenal as well. We had her a few years ago, probably maybe five years ago up in Bangor. Mm -hmm. Same with James as well. Um, And then somebody new to Maine is Luke LaRoque Walker. He and Esther are kind of bouncing off each other with their courses. Nice. Yes. So it'll be fantastic. Esther's there with Ivaclar, right? Yes. Yep. She's digital dentures and lower suction dentures, combination of multiple things. Very cool. Well, I think the great thing about this conference is we have a little bit of everything for everyone um, in the denture and denture world, from lab techs to denturists, e- even down to front desk and assistants. We have a little bit for everybody at this show, which is nice. I don't even think there is a dental technician show anywhere on that part of the country. So, I mean, this is a great opportunity for technicians to get their credit, but also just to mingle with other dental-minded people. Yeah, I think maybe uh, the closest one might be New York. So we are the one up here. So hopefully people will be able to come out and mingle and meet some new faces. Absolutely. So what is it? MainLDA.com, right? Correct. Yes. Awesome. And we also have a Facebook page that it's on as well. It's the same thing, Main LDA on Facebook. Everyone go check it out. This is going to be a great show. Can't wait. Thank you. So, Patrick, did you used to be the president of the MLDA? Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. That it sounds was, like uh, it might have been a little stressful. <laughs> oh, yeah, oh, it could be at times. Just It, it, it kind of like went on forever. Uh, yeah. So what's funny is, you know, we, we uh, back... In the day, it was like back in, it was 2011 when we kind of created this newer association and we'd had a little bit of uh, strife and infighting. And at one point, Austin's daughter, Kelly, was kind of the first president. And then she was like, I, you know, I don't know if I, if I really want to do this. And uh, <laughs> so then they kind of came to me and and I didn't realize at the time, but they were like, you're, you're kind of an outsider. You don't have any beef with anyone. There's no, uh, you know, there, there's, no one knows anything about you. So you're going to be hates it, Patrick. You know? <laughs> yeah. Well, not yet. <laughs> no, not yet. Yeah, no. yeah. Yeah. Give it time. Give it time. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So then uh, every year we'd have an election and everyone like would say, nah, you're doing great. You just, uh, yeah, no one would, uh, would want to step up. So, uh, so finally, uh, it was a couple of years ago. I just said, look, all right, I, I've been doing, uh, I want to say it was like seven years going. I was like, I'm like going to withdraw. I'm stepping out. And you're the president for seven years, seven years. Yeah. How wow. does that work? Why do you not board off? Or seat Part off? For one, we're, we're a very, very small group. I mean, there's, there's only, uh, there's probably 35 ish active working denturists in the state of Maine. Mm -hmm. So if you can imagine, like, and at one point, I want to say we had like 24, 25 uh, members, which is huge. If you could have, you know, two thirds to three quarters of your active, you know, working population be a member of any association, like that'd be huge, right? Yeah, I agree. Totally. But getting that, you know, uh, everyone to show up at, at, at a meeting or meetings, because at the time, you know, everyone just got together in person, you know, the the, uh, the phenomenon of Zoom and, and all that mm-hmm. stuff hadn't really caught on. So you get the same five or six people that are, would always show up to a meeting and, you know, it, it just would be sort of that way. And then, um, yeah, it, it, it took me at the, at the last meeting to be able to, uh, uh, I think it was like 2019, and basically just said, you know, hey, uh, it's time for me to step back and step down. And so I'm not going anywhere, but, you know, it's it's time for someone else to take the mantle. And so and even about a year ago was when uh, I said, all right, I'm, I'm not going to be on the uh, the conference. I'm not going to chair the conference committee you know, anymore. And Ashley was good enough. She wasn't even licensed yet. She actually offered to uh, to step in. And so I've been kind of working uh, in tandem with her to kind of help make connections and, and, uh, and foster, um, inroads and, and try to get her up to speed and get her, uh, her connected. So, uh, so I'm still here. I'm still, you know, working behind the scenes, but I figure if, if, uh, if we don't teach the youngins, uh, oh, you know, yeah. it, it's hard for them to learn. I think it's pretty amazing. You've got a female and a young, you know, it's pretty neat y'all, especially you, Ashley, that takes big balls. Just say it. <laughs> she got them too. <laughs> You know, to put what Patrick was saying in a nutshell, after doing this for by far too many years myself, 
it doesn't matter if it's a Cub Scout troop or a national or a state or provincial association. The same handful of people do the job. That's it. You have a difficult time getting the amount of people that you truly need to help with the situation. That's my experience over the past, since, I don't know, since the 19, early 1980s. So there you are. Here I am. <laughs> I've always heard that it's not so much how many people you get involved, but it's how loud the people are you get involved. <laughs> Are we going to see you being loud? Yes, oh, I'm yeah. very loud. Absolutely. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Very good. Right. Yeah. Yes. It's hard to shut him up when you get him going. <laughs> <laughs> good. Now, the other thing that I, I didn't really even know how to like organize and run a meeting too. So uh, as I went to NDA meetings and got on, got more involved there and, and saw how to you know organize and, and really set up agendas and then started to attend, uh, you know, other, other meetings and, and watch and see how conferences were run and, and get ideas. And then uh, when Jeremiah Nas came on board, you know, and he had the experience of being with the FDLA and that's a, that's a pretty uh, well-run organization. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said, man, you guys need to do it like this. And I'm like, I don't know. I've, I've never been, didn't know. So, you know, we're, we're in a way all, also still kind of in our in some respects, still in our infancy. Uh, the organization's about 10 years old, but we're still kind of putting the, the pieces together. And uh, yeah. uh, some days I kind of scratch my head and wonder like, man, how do we put all this on? How do we make it happen? But we always find a way to, to make it go. And you guys are managing yourself, right? You don't have a managing group that's managing your organization, which means you do have to learn everything. We just got one. Oh, we, we, good. That'll be helpful. Probably a bit, what has it been, about seven or eight months that we hired an association manager? Yeah, and she's been phenomenal helping us through just getting mm -hmm. our meetings organized because uh, especially during COVID, we didn't see each other. Um, so we would end up taking our meeting time just talking about whatnots versus getting an agenda done. So she sets us down to business and we get it done. Yep. So is this the first meeting back at it since COVID? It is. In person. In yeah. person. Yeah, yeah, so you took a couple of years off? Yes. Yep. Are we anticipating a large attendee number because it's the first time back? I sure hope so. <laughs> <laughs> if everything goes right. If everything yeah. goes right. That's the plan. I tell you what, there's nice. nothing like an in-person meeting when you haven't had one in two or three years the energy and just the networking and everybody's just so happy to see each other that I'll bet you it's very, very well. I went to a meeting last weekend and it was the most, it was the largest meeting that I've seen in years and everybody was just pumped and got all the learning and just, uh, it was, it was great. So I hope you guys have a great meeting. And of course, Elvis is going to be there talking. So that makes it even more fun. Yeah. Check is in the mail. <laughs> <laughs> That's segue back to you, friend. <laughs> <laughs> I'm excited. I've never been to Maine. I've I've never been to a denturist meeting. I'm super excited. This will be your first time to Maine. Yeah, absolutely. We'll go down to the harbor and have some beers, kid. Oh yeah. <laughs> Get Patrick to buy you a few lobsters. There you go. You know what's funny is people either absolutely love lobster or they hate it. You know? Oh, I love it. I'm from Florida. I thought it was just all about the butter. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. It's just a vehicle. <laughs> so Austin and Ashley, how many patients do you guys see in a day at your clinic? Or do you have like an average or is it super busy? And how do you guys work together like at the clinic? I think we average anywhere between seven to nine patients. A day? Wow, that's a lot. Oh, uh, We used to work for New England Denture Center where we saw 30 and 35 patients a day. Oh, wow. And to me... Okay, I never want to see that again. Yeah, I bet. Move them in, move them out, rawhide. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, and I'm no spring chicken, okay? I was damn tired by the end of it. I mean, it yeah. got to a point where, <laughs> geez, Patrick and I took a trip to, where the hell were we, in Quebec City or Montreal, Pat? <laughs> yeah, we were in Montreal. Yeah, and by the time we got there, okay, Patrick had to carry my suitcase oh. into the hotel for me. I was that bad off. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but then I realized at that time, okay, that I had a heart problem, which I didn't even know about. So I was tired. Yeah. And that was part of it, you know. But we work, we work together, Ashley and I, we work together 
very well. Mm-hmm. I go in, sit down, uh, she does the work, and I gather the money. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to ask that. That was my next question. So do you guys see it? <laughs> works, works great. <laughs> yeah, I bet. So you see, you both see the patients, or were you being funny when you said that? So how does that work? You know, to tell you the God's honest truth, Ashley sees 90% of the patient, and she will, you know, call me in and say, let's have a look at this together because two sets of eyes are better than one. And what would you do in this situation? What do you think we should do? And we have a little chat in our our outer office and then we go in and we see the patient. And after she's told me what her findings are and we kind of, kind of take it from there, but she does in actual fact, I mean, I'm blessed to have her. Really? Yeah. She really does the large portion of, of the work. I help her wherever I can in the lab, you know, go in there and do that yeah. occasionally. She's a great colleague. That's great. So I know, Patrick, that we've talked to you in the past and you've mentioned how balancing seeing patients and doing lab work is one of the biggest struggles with denturists. Ashley, are you seeing that too? Are you spending weekends and evenings catching up on lab work? Well, I go into the office pretty early. I like to say that Pat and I are complete opposites in that respect. I go in and I can be in the office six o'clock in the morning so that I get my lab done, work done before patients, oh, okay. um, yep. see my patients, and then I'm done. Whereas a backstory and a funny story is... Patrick used to work in a few different offices when I worked in Bangor with him. And one day I kind of volunteered him because he had work, lab work to do that night to do a rebase for me mm-hmm. for a patient who needed it. Um, they came in at like four o'clock in the afternoon. They needed it for the weekend, what have you. Sure. And I kind of volunteered him to do <laughs> this rebase. When he got there, I told him about it. He goes, well, you're going to stay and help me. (laughs) At that point, lab work was kind of foreign to me. I had no idea what I was getting myself into. And I think I left the lab at about midnight because I I just had no idea what I was getting myself into. So I tend to get my stuff done early in the morning. After patients are done, I can leave for the day. If I have more lab work to do, I will go back into the lab. But I try to try to get my stuff done before. Yeah, I think we should elaborate on that because it's a good story. And, and I think a lot of the technicians out there will appreciate it. But I was coming back from a satellite office and I was going to be back around like five or five thirty. So she said, the patient will come in, we'll take an impression and we'll just deliver it tomorrow. And I said, well, I've got to go to my Waterville office and I've got lab work that's due for tomorrow that I've got to do tonight. I'm going to be here till probably midnight, one in the morning, getting it done. And I said, I'll tell you what, I'll take the impression. And then you can pour it and, and, and walk through. I'll teach you how to do this. And she said, okay, all right, all right. And she was motivated. <laughs> so uh, I started walking her through it. And it got to be, a, it was, I want to say it was a little after 11. And you could see her eyes are getting heavy. And she's sort of like, oh, man. And I'm like, no, kid, we got to keep going, you know. And uh, I think finally it, it was it was almost, yeah, it was almost midnight when I was like, all right, get out of here. Go home. She had, she had like a 45-minute drive home, too. So I said, I'll, I'll finish it up. And uh, so, yeah, we, we learned lots of lessons that night. One of them was don't uh, underestimate how much time each step takes, because uh, even in a perfect world and in a vacuum, there's things that come up and go wrong and, and will change on you. And yeah, the lab component can't be uh, understated how important it is. So we did end up getting it done. I ended up after I get done with patients in Waterville, she met up with me again to deliver the, uh, the denture the next day. Uh, I think I actually maybe finish polishing it while I was in, uh, I was in Waterville, but uh, we were able to get this gentleman, uh, his, his dentures relined for uh, his job interview on Monday. So. Wow. And she's never made an overnight promise again. No. (laughs) Unless I'm the one that's going to do it. And I, you know, I'm promising myself, but I'll never promise somebody else to do the work. (laughs) Yeah. Patrick's like, it's midnight. This is early. (laughs) Oh, for sure. So, Ashley, are you going to eventually get on the board or are you going to stick doing the uh, conference planning? Well, actually, I'm on the NDA board. How are you? Nice. I am. I'm the treasurer on the NDA board. Wow. Um, So I I got my feet out there 
And as far as the main board, we'll see offices are going to be opening up. So I might. I'm not sure yet. Yeah. You went big. You went national. I did. (laughs) The position opened and I said, why not just jump feet first into it? Nice. So nice. Good to see you getting out there because they got a big meeting, what, in October? Yes. Yeah, that's yep. Las Vegas. Yeah. Will you guys be attending? I hope so. Always try. Couldn't this year and then COVID and all that. Oh, yeah. Yes. But yeah, yes. would love to. Yeah, we actually had, we were fortunate. We had uh, our biggest NDA kind of rebound here last year. It, it came out much better than expected. So we thought for sure there would be maybe a little bit of a holdout, you know, just with, with COVID still being what it is. But yeah, we had we had a really, really nice turnout. So that's fantastic. And yeah. everyone just looking to get back out there again. For sure. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. So what's the plan? Ashley, are you taking over the practice? Austin, are you ever gonna let her or that's the plan eventually. Yeah. Good for you. I always want him to stick around as long as he wants to do it. That's, you know, I don't want to kick him out at all. You know, maybe one o'clock in the afternoon, I'll tell him to go home. You know, <laughs> we have a couple of patients left. But, you know, other than that, I like him sticking around. I yeah. bet you do. We have a very good relationship. She's sort of like a third daughter to me. Aww. And uh, I'll do anything that I can to help her and uh, to provide her with what she needs. You know, if it's me leaving to go home at uh, one o'clock in the afternoon, that's great. (laughs) Happy to help. (laughs) Happy to help out, yes. But, you know, we we just have, I think Ashley can tell you, we have a very good good relationship. It uh, It comes through. It's slow and easy. You know, neither one of us are looking to set the world on fire. We just want to, you know, be happy and do a good job. And I get a great kick out of sitting in the front office. And when patients come out front and, you know, I talk to them for a little bit while she's still in the clinic picking up or in the lab or whatever. And when they look at me and they go, she's amazing. Aww. And I go, fantastic. That's, cool. <laughs> That's great. What better accolade can you give or get from a patient? Not, nothing, says, yeah. He's amazing. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, there you are, and here I am. Aww. Sometimes I think I need to carry around like a little needle just to pop my head a little bit from swelling so much. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. Well, it sounds to me like you're working damn hard for it, so. Thank you. Yes, yeah. yeah, she did. Yeah, yeah she still is. Yes. I recommend her highly. <laughs> Sounds like we're all going to get to hear a lot more from her and all the associations and everything you're helping out in. I think it's great. Yeah. I encourage you. You have a great mentor. I mean, it's. <laughs> I do. I'm looking forward to meeting everybody out in Maine in uh, June for we the are too. MLDA yeah. meeting. We'll put a link up on this episode's show notes. So if anyone's interested, let's. Let's get some technicians coming. Sure. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Very cool. And Patrick, as always, great to talk to you. For sure. Are you are I you going to be doing any recording June. at the uh, at the show or not sure? Okay. Yet. All right. Not Game time sure. decision. Yeah. Yep. We'll definitely keep you in the loop if we can. Thank you, guys. Awesome, everybody. Excellent. That was fantastic. Great to meet everyone. Doing great things out in Maine. Thanks. Well, thank you guys very much for having us yes, and. Thank you. Uh, we look forward to seeing you uh, in June. Awesome. And uh, and meeting you and uh, emptying your wallet. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, I, we just try to help out. Yeah, you know? sure do. Empty your wallet away, I say. Spend some money, yeah. Elvis. Remind me to get traveler's checks before I go. <laughs> oh, jeez. Um, I should have kept my mouth shut. <laughs> Awesome, everybody. Have a great weekend, and we'll talk to you soon. Thanks, guys. Okay, thanks again very much. Thank you. you. Bye-bye, guys. What mixes outstanding Vera Echo LCD 3D printer delivers fast print speed and exceptional accuracy due to its 95% LED light uniformity. Print temporary and permanent crowns and bridges, models and dies, surgical guides, splints, custom trays, 
and even dentures with Whitmix's Vera Model OS, Vera Guide OS, Keystone Keysplint Soft, Denka Denture, Denka Temporary Crown and Bridge, Bago Varseo Crown Plus, Bago Varseo Smile Temp, Veracast, and Vera Tray Resins. That is a lot of resins. Vera Echo and its 120 by 80 millimeter print plate is ready to provide its printing power right out of the box with 54 calibrated LEDs for curing consistency, ultra accurate, and smooth prints with its 49 micron pixel size and an easy to use touchscreen. If you're looking for a compact, fast, and accurate 3D printer, call 1-800-626-5651 or visit Whitmix.com for more information or to order the Whitmix Vera Echo 3D printer. And as always, we appreciate your support of the podcast, Whitmix. A huge thanks to Patrick, Austin, and Ashley for coming on our podcast. And I know our fans love it when we have more than one guest, so I'm sure this is going to be well-received. We love talking to dentures and hope others in the dental lab industry see the benefit of having them and, more importantly, seeing it as a career path that many technicians can take. And got to say, while the main licensed Dentures Association meeting is this weekend, and kind of short notice for anyone that wants to go, but if you can, we've got a link on this episode show notes. You might want to check out the National Dentures Association meeting. They have it every year in Vegas. Dun, dun, dun. You know how everybody loves Vegas. This year's meeting is October 12th to the 13th. And we will also put a link to the register for that conference on this show's notes. And we encourage all technicians that are interested in taking their career to the next level to attend and see exactly what a great group this is. And now to celebrate CDT and Dental Technician Appreciation Month, here is our audio thanks that we've got this week. In honor of Dental Technicians Month, LMT wants you to know we greatly admire your ability to weather storms, pandemics, and questionable prescriptions. You are superheroes who never get to jump into the phone booth, but let your capes peek out every now and then anyway. All of us at LMT want to thank you for your hard work, your skills, your resilience, your impressive resourcefulness, and most of all, your optimism. We celebrate you this month and every day of every year. Thank you so f***ing much. And this is Sandra Boritz. Hi, Voices. Thank you for all you do. This is Tony Prestopino. I want to thank Stephen Killian for being a great mentor, great person, and a great friend. He died unexpectedly this year, and I want to recognize him of being one of the best CDTs I know. And thanks again. Thank you for the thanks. There's still three more episodes left to get them in, so record them and email them to info at voicesfromthebench.com, and let's celebrate June together. All right, everybody. That's all we got for you. We'll talk to you next week. Bye. 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 I ain't got my together. This will be fun to edit. <laughs>